Good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, on what is our second webinar in a series of Making Trees Work For You. Firstly, my introduction, I'm Tim Lydon, Dill Hills Forestry Director, and it's my pleasure to be your host today. Sadly, we cannot meet face to face, and many of the summer and autumn shows where you would have had a good opportunity to meet many of my team are not happening this year. So, with a crash course in using Zoom, Microsoft Teams and Skype, we've devised a series of webinars to ensure that we can still reach across the country and let you know a bit more about our topic today, woodland creation. The rural landscape is changing. Brexit, common agricultural policy, changes in the new planting support in England, and now coronavirus, which is still with us. There is also a significantly greater focus on carbon and climate mitigation as well for us to consider. Which of these are threats and which of our opportunities is difficult to fathom at times. But one size certainly doesn't fit all. One positive we can take from coronavirus, at least, is that our mileage has dropped together with a subsequent fall in fuel prices. And I have heard of red diesel being about 18 pence a litre. Through everything though, forestry and woodland remain a steady and loyal partnership option when it comes to providing farmers and landowners with additional income streams. I hope this webinar will give you a glimpse of what a woodland can provide and the funding available to help you create it, enabling you to be more to be able to make more informed decisions going forward in order to help secure greater financial security for both you, your family, and your future generations. We have three presenters today. Our guest presenter is from the CLA, focusing on climate change. And we have two presenters from Till Hill who will give brief insights into some of the benefits trees can bring together with the grants available and also how Till Hill can help you assess the opportunity of your farm, help you secure the funding for the project, and then how we can help manage your woodland to ensure you get the very best return from your investment. We will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end, but do please feel free to fire those questions in on the Q&A panel on screen, and we will endeavor to answer them as best we can once we have heard from our presenters. The webinar is also being recorded and will be available for you to, to review at your leisure. So our first speaker is Stuart Pearson, our regional can manager covering the north and central England, born in Yorkshire and proud of it. He has years of experience in forestry and joined Till Hill over 16 years ago. He's not a newcomer to woodland creation, having carried out a lot of planting in the 1990s. He has a passion to increase woodland cover and wants to share this with you today. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. And um, what I hope to do today is give you a bit of an insight into the grants and incentives currently available for woodland planting and to show you just a quick example of what can be done with them. Firstly, let's consider why we might plant trees. Personally, I would suggest that one of the primary reasons should always be timber production. But as you can see, there are a multitude of other benefits and reasons for planting trees especially with our increasing understanding of climate change and where that is taking us. Luckily, there's currently some good grant incentives available to assist the landowner in planting and maintaining of trees and woodlands. The primary route for many considering planting trees will be the Countryside Stewardship Scheme. And those of you that are familiar with the agri-environmental schemes will be conversant with the type of layered funding that is available. The application is created from multiple standard costs to give an overall hectare payment. 
In this case, trees, protection and fencing are the primary costs with a cap of £6,800 per hectare. There is a maintenance grant of £200 a hectare payable over 10 years and currently it, you are eligible to receive BPS for as long as that exists. However, whilst the scheme is open all year round, minimum areas apply of three hectares and it doesn't promote commercial forestry. Biodiversity is very much at the heart of the countryside stewardship scheme and the enhancements that brings. In a similar format to the countryside stewardship is the HS2 fund. And for those of you that are within 25 miles of the route, this would be a chosen option. Similar to countryside stewardship, it offers a layered calculation of costs, but critically in this case covers 100% of agreed costs up to a higher cap of £8,500 a hectare. And whilst you still continue to receive maintenance payments, these are paid in blocks in years five and ten. Now, hopefully, in recognition of the extra work and costs required to plan and design larger schemes, there is the Woodland Creation Planning Grant. Briefly paid in two stages. The first stage is a £1,000 payment towards a desktop exercise to ensure eligibility to move on to stage two. The stage two payments are area based at £150 a hectare and capped at £30,000. And that's really to support the landowner in gathering all the required information to create a UKFS compliant plan. That's a UK forestry standard. And it's a, it's a real, real help, that is. Finally, on my brief insight into grants, there is the Wooden Carbon Fund. And this is very much intended for larger schemes where timber production is a primary objective. Now, details of this particular scheme and woodland carbon will be covered in Julian's later presentation, so I won't go into any more detail on that. Now, moving swiftly on to the case study. Why plant? Now, in the example I'm going to give, the owner had acquired a small spot in a state in the north of England in a pretty sorry state. Typically in many of this area, the existing woodlands were of a poor square linear design and mainly coniferous, planted in the 60s and 70s. And there was little or no benefits to the landscape or biodiversity of the area. And the photo in the top there shows the estate as was. Now the client's passion is shooting and this was his primary consideration. However, the estate is in an AOMB and sits in an important water catchment. So design and species choice were critically important. And the broad objectives stated within the planning phase were to develop the shooting potential of the estate, enhancing the landscaping character and increasing the natural character of the estates, woodlands, by naturalizing their appearance through expanding and connecting them. So we knew what we wanted to plant, but where? We wanted to plant to enhance the shoot. So design of the woodlands to create a hanging woodlands, characteristic of the, this, this area. Create linkage through to the river, river corridors uh, via riparian gill plantings. And I've always already said that it's in AOMB. So it was very much, the planting very much uh, was constraints driven, but looking to the future, there is potential payment to ecosystem services to come with the design and planning of it. So we use the Woodland Creation Planning Grant to allow us to work up with key stakeholders to design a scheme, which sought to develop a uh, planting that was sympathetic and compliant with the desires and the, of the area. Not an easy challenge. So, what to plant? As part of the design process, there are a number of tools available to assist in the choice of species. In this instance, we use the ecological sites classification tool that's available through the Forest Commission research pages. 
and the National Vegetation Classification, which identifies uh, species types for given um, sites. In this instance, the NVC classification for the woodlands is W11 upland oak woodland type. The primary species being sessile oak, birch, Scots pine, brown hazel and holly and some other lesser species. Importantly, the woodlands will be a framework for the spotting activity, but sustainability and production were very much key drivers in the decision making. And woodlands, whilst it's about the trees, it's, all, it's also about the space in between the trees. So within the country stewardship scheme, a 20% allowance is allowed for open space, and that created internal glades, and ed woodland edge habitat that complements the new woodland design and the wider ecological benefits. So, the plan. I hope you can see on here, the dark green is the 23 hectares of existing woodlands. And as I've already said, it was square linear design was very much uh, in evidence. So the new planting of over 50 hectares in the lighter green tried to follow land form, created the linkage and the uh, a more harmonious design for the estates woodlands. So to date, what has the countryside stewardship done for us? Well, for a start, it contributed a thousand pounds towards the cost of creating a woodland management plan for the 23 hectares of existing woodlands on the property. And within that, there was a 10 year felling license agreement in, put in place. It provided eight and a half thousand pounds. And that covered, in this instance, the costs required to consult and plan and design a woodland planting that was compliant with the UK, UK forestry standard. And finally, over £250,000 worth of capital grants. And that covered a majority of the establishment costs, planting, labour, trees, protection, fencing, etc. And as a result, we achieved more than 65,000 trees over 50 hectares, over 40 field gates and access points created for the future, 5,000 metres of stock fencing, and some forest road construction and other minor environmental works, and some non eligible tree and shrub planting on the peripheries. Importantly, having worked with the key stakeholders, the scheme contributes significantly to the strategic objectives of the Nidderdale AOMB, Yorkshire Dales National Park, and the National Character Area for the Dales, as well as more local landscape character assessments for the upper Nidderdale Valley. It created new habitats for priority woodland bird species. It's within area of high space priority for water quality, and seek, will seek to reduce flood risk and keep the rivers cool. And as I touched on previous, whilst this doesn't uh, receive payments for at the moment, may do in the future. So, what's next? The maintenance payments, totaling about £10,000 a year, are in place. And those of you who've noted the tubes as part of the maintenance com commitments, that sees the uh, phased removal of these tubes at the end of their useful life and recycling. It's a programme of thinning, selective felling and clear felling across 23 hectares of woodlands within the 10 year felling licence in the woodland management plan. The estate has also entered into a wider estate, higher tier agro-environment agreement and there is potential within that to add in higher tier woodland support for deer management, squirrel control, deadwood management, etc. There's further inward investment planned with a sporting activity and farming and critically more tree planting. 
thank you for your time. I will now pass you back to Tim to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Stuart. Right, thank you. Sorry for that wee pause. Um, our second spe speaker is Alice Ritchie, who is currently the Climate Change Advisor for the CLA. She previously worked for the New Zealand government on forestry, agriculture and climate change policy. Alice is a qualified barrister and solicitor uh, specialising in environmental law. And she is currently midway through a Master of Science in Food Security from the University of Edinburgh. Alice advises on matters concerning mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, adapting to climate change, water management and water quality. Over to you, Alice. Thank you, Tim. I will just share my screen. Great, hopefully that's all good. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me as a guest on um, today's webinar. Um, yeah, my name is Alice Ritchie. I am the uh, Climate Change and Water Lead for the Country Land and Business Association. Um, and yeah, today I'll cover kind of the, some of the broader policy context um, stuff around climate change and how woodland creation fits into all of that. So I'm hoping that combined with Julian and Stuart's wealth of forestry knowledge, you'll um, yeah, come away knowing a wee bit more about woodland creation uh, and climate change. Uh, so for a bit of background and context, uh, the UK signed and then ratified the Paris Agreement in 2016. This was a global agreement that aimed to keep global warming well below two degrees Celsius. Um, and by 2019, the UK was the first, uh, first major economy to put a net zero target into legislation. So placing a legal obligation on the government um, to get greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions down to net zero. So the important part of that is in the word net. Um, we need to reduce emissions as far as we possibly can, but then we also need to take measures that um, absorb carbon out of the atmosphere, atmosphere to get that balance to zero. So this is where trees come in. Um, it's also really important, I think, particularly in light of um, sort of COVID-19 economic recovery and things to remember that this is a target that's based on science. It's not just a legal target. Um, we scientifically have to get to net zero emissions by 2050 if we want to have any chance of keeping global warming uh, below two degrees Celsius. Um, so this net zero legislation announcement was swiftly followed by a huge number of different um, reports from international groups, um, environmental groups, other NGOs, government agencies, all sorts, um, all basically outlining the importance of considering land use as part of our, um, uh, as part of the wider climate change picture. Um, and every single one of these reports came to the conclusion that we need to massively scale up woodland creation um, across the UK to reach our targets. Um, so looking at climate change and land use a little bit more broadly, um, forestry is currently a net carbon sink. Um, but wide, wider land use, so agriculture, um, peatland, that is a net emitter, emitting around 58 million tonnes of um, carbon dioxide equivalent in 2017. The net is from the year before, which is why the figure is a little bit different there. Um, so it's quite important to think about w uh, wider land use when we're talking about woodland creation, because if we're scaling up um, our tree planting, we need to find a place to do it. Um, so the Committee on Climate Change, you'll see here, um, has proposed what, what the UK could look like land use wise by 2050 um, by reducing, agri reducing agricultural land by 22%. So they envision this being done um, through a combination of sustainable intensification, um, but also changing consumer diet. Uh, choices so that we reduce our meat consumption and um, increase the number of plant-based foods that we eat. Um, so that, yeah, that map shows what the breakdown would look like if that was to happen. Um, and woodland cover would have the opportunity with that sort of freed up land um, to increase from 13% to 17%. Um, I think their higher ambition scenario is aiming to get it to 19%. It's 
quite a significant um, change in land use. So uh, plenty of different, um, different organisations have proposed targets to um, aim, to re uh, aim to achieve the level of woodland, woodland creation that we need to meet our climate change targets. Um, they range from 7,200 hectares per year in the government's 25 year environment plan all the way up to 120,000 a year in a um, Friends of the Earth report. So the Committee on Climate Change uh, is aiming for around 30,000 in their lower ambition scenario and up to 50,000 hectares per year in their higher ambition scenario. Um, so this is also what the CLA is aiming for. We're trying to help our members um, achieve, yeah, achieve that kind of higher ambition somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 hectares per year. Um, it is really important to remember that these targets, none of them are enough to actually reach our climate change goals unless they happen in conjunction um, with massive emissions reductions across the economy. Um, so that is quite an important, I think, thing to really remember about all of, um, all of this is that tree planting is part of the picture, but um, it has to happen in conjunction with a massive reduction in fossil fuel use. Um, yeah, there we go. So there are three main um, sort of policy areas, I suppose, that are being looked at when we're talking about trees and climate change. And so we need a combination of policies across all of these three areas um, to achieve the right outcomes. So the first is um, basically what I'm sort of considering larger scale forestry and woodland. So scaling up new woodland creation combined with um, bringing existing woodland into active management has the potential to save 22 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Um, the second policy area is all about trees on farms. So the Committee on Climate Change has a target to um, double the number of trees on farms that there are in the UK. So um, this this sort of encompasses everything you can really imagine, uh, smaller scale forestry and woodland, um, sort of little copses and things like that, but also traditional agroforestry, so silver pasture and silver arable, um, hedgerows, riparian planting, shelter belts, buffer strips, field margins, um, the works. So this, they think, has the potential to save um, 6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Um, and the third policy area is harvested wood products. Um, I'm slightly yeah, limited by time to go into great detail about this, but it is really important that we consider policies um, around the end use of wood products because um, it, yeah, it makes a big difference to our climate change goals. If wood's used for construction, for example, um, and not for fuel, it does increase the length of carbon storage. So it's, it's a big part of kind of the whole picture. Um, and that, yes, yeah, so that has the potential to save us 14 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Um, so what kind of framework are we working in at the moment? Um, current policies, as uh, sort of outlined um, by Stuart, is centred quite a lot around um, woodland creation, grant schemes for establishment costs, and then there's also combined, um, this is combined with carbon markets, um, and that can be through private or public funding. There's also some situations where farmers and landowners and foresters can be paid for the ecosystem services um, provided by trees. Um, the government has recently published an England tree strategy, um, which is currently out for consultation. And this outlines how they plan to use what they're calling a Nature for Climate Fund of 640 million pounds to scale up um, tree planting and also peatland restoration. This is um, the main mechanism that they've outlined for um, uh, to, to reach that 30,000 hectares per year target. Sitting underneath this is the new agriculture bill, which is currently in the House of Lords um, at the moment. And this is aiming to create a system to replace the EU um, common agricultural policy and basic payment system. So it will pay land managers for the public goods they provide through a system called the Environmental Land Management Scheme, or ELM. Um, the way that it is currently being proposed, there are three tiers to ELM. The second and third, I think, are the most promising at this stage 
for larger scale woodland creation. Tier two will pay for um, or aims to pay for woodland creation, woodland management, but also public access. Uh, tier three is go goes a lot bigger than that um, and aims for sort of big land land use change at a landscape scale. So we'd be talking about yeah massive scale woodland creation or peatland restoration in that um, circumstance. Um, as for policies for trees on farms, um, at the moment there aren't that many out there. Uh, they agroforestry, for example, kind of falls into a bit of a grey area policy-wise at the moment. The uh, density of planting tends to be uh, too few trees for the land to be classed as, um, sorry, too many trees for the land to be classed as agricultural land, but too few trees for it to be classed as woodland. So it sort of fits in this, yeah, slightly weird grey area, particularly in terms of grant funding and things like that. Um, but under the um, proposed environmental land management scheme, both tiers one and two could be used to encourage more trees on farms. So tier one, um, as, yeah, as it's currently planned, indicates that they are happy to pay for uh, field margins, riparian buffer strips and things like that. And then tier two scales that up slightly um, and will yeah, pay for hedgerows, shrubs, habitat creation and flood risk management, which is um, an important benefit that trees provide. Um, there's also been indications from the government in the past uh, couple of years that um, that they there will be some kind of farm emissions reduction plan. We don't know really any details about it or what it will look like, but it will likely be looking at farms um, uh, as a whole and probably encourage things like carbon footprinting on farms. So if this is the case, I think there'll be quite a lot of encouragement for land managers to, uh, or for farmers specifically, to balance out the emissions from their farm enterprise. So from livestock or um, fertilizer emissions or something like that, balance it out by doing activities that sequester carbon. I mean, in many cases, this will be trees. So um, yeah, I think that, that will sort of be another way that they try and incentivize more trees on farms. Um, the tree strategy also touches very briefly on agroforestry. Um, it specifically talks about the need for grant schemes, but also that we need a clarity on the definition and a wee bit more advice. Um, so the big question will be, um, are these policies enough? So at the moment, um, the Committee on Climate Change is crunch the numbers for us and they estimate that we need 500 million pounds per year for forestry and woodland, 2 million pounds per year for trees on farms, plus, as I said before, the Nature for Climate Fund covers peatland restoration as well, so 74 million um, pounds per year for peatland restoration. So we're looking at, um, to, to achieve the level of um, tree planting and peatland restoration needed, 774 million pounds per year. Whereas the Nature for Climate Fund has only pledged 640 um, at this stage. So it'll be interesting to see how much of that does go towards woodland creation and how much ends up going towards um, peatland and yeah, how they kind of balance, balance that out. Um, the, um, so there's also going to be quite a few questions around how carbon markets are used and if they ultimately end up allowing um, big sort of heavy emitting um, companies to offset their emissions, essentially giving them a license to keep emitting. Um, as I said before, we have to be doing both. We have to be planting trees, but we also have to be reducing emissions. So it's important that um, however the um, however the carbon markets are used, they don't just give you know airlines and things a license to keep emitting um, carbon dioxide. So um, as also outlined a wee bit by Stuart, trees provide a huge number of benefits beyond climate change, um, including for biodiversity and also for uh, flood risk. So we've seen the impact in countries like New Zealand where they've uh, planted a huge number of fast growing carbon absorbing um, Pinus radiata trees, uh, aiming to achieve climate change targets and have done so relatively effectively from a climate change perspective. Um, but less so for biodiversity and also um, this massively increased in amount of sediment and things in waterways. And they're sort of now battling through the implications of that, having planted all these trees 20-ish um, years ago. So it is really important that we consider policies 
um, in a slightly more holistic way and don't just look at it purely from a climate change um, silo. There um, are also a number of non-financial barriers that grant schemes and carbon markets might not be enough to overcome. Uh, so it's really important that we encourage training, upskilling, knowledge and advice and all that kind of stuff, which I'm sure is where Till Hill come in. Um, and lastly, as briefly explained earlier, uh, trees have to be viewed, um, or any kind of woodland creation has to be viewed in terms of wider land use and um, other land use goals. So it is really important we consider where these trees go in relation to food production and peatland restoration. Um, so there will be, will be links to the um, upcoming food strategy and peatland strategy. So it'll all be about really using land for the right purpose. Um, and yeah, considering all the different economic benefits and climate benefits all uh, relatively holistically. Um, so that's me, I think, but thank you very much for listening. And I'm, I'm looking forward to answering any of your questions that you might have um, at the, uh, yeah, following Julian's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Uh, we do seem to either either the uh, audience has totally disappeared, uh, or we've got a problem uh, with the Q and A questions area. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Georgina whether we can open up the chat channel uh, for questions instead of the Q and A, because we we don't seem to be able to uh, access that. So thank you for that, Alice. Um, our third speaker is Julian Olson, uh, our regional manager covering southern and southwest England. Julian uh, has been has had a broad career covering the UK, North Scotland, Yorkshire, and then returning to his home ground in the southwest. He's enjoyed 40 years in forestry and has a solid understanding of silviculture in the south, both conifers and hardwoods. He's always been thinking about trees and timber, but now he's moving to trees, timber and carbon. So over to you, Julian. Thanks, Tim. Um, let us demonstrate our crash course in Zoom. Share the screen. Um, what I must start with is when we get there, is an apology, first of all, as you said to everybody that we've done a crash course in, in Zoom presentation. Um, and anyone that knows me knows that this is not my normal style of presenting. Um, normally, I like to um, engage the audience with uh, perhaps moving around the, the stage or um, putting in a bit of music or even adding a, a song or two in. Um, so do please uh, don't get worried if you see me fall off my chair or disappear off screen. Uh, it's just a normal presentation style creeping back in. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, opportunities of woodland creation and as Stuart said uh, earlier, particularly on uh, the Forestry Commission Woodland Carbon Fund uh, and then we'll look at the considerations around that and carbon itself. It's a very short presentation so you have to bear with me that it will be a very broad brushstroke. When I was preparing for this the, the, the slide that we've got in front of us now uh, actually demonstrates the flexibility and multi benefits of, of forestry and woodland creation. In the background the coniferous woodland uh, up until the 1960s, early 1970s, would have been steep, uh, poor quality grazing land uh, in Exmoor. Um, it was planted up with timber production as the uh, primary uh, aim at that time. The land over the, the, the following sort of 40, 50 years has then changed hands uh, and is now owned by um, an owner who has shooting and sporting as a particular high objective of ownership and that's why we've planted the new woodlands in the foreground but the conifers still remain available to be thinned open space developed and create all those other benefits as well 
So um, we've, we've already touched on why look at woodland creation and I want to reiterate that it is a land-based uh, investment. Um, so therefore it does benefit from the current tax and uh, legislative uh, benefits uh, that farming has as well. It is a future hedge against uh, inflation on the past performance. Timber has performed increasingly beneficial uh, over inflation. You get the biotic growth of trees over the years, so they get bigger. And um, in itself, woodland is an asset class that can be bought and sold on the open market, just as farmland. <coughs> Excuse me. But also consider that uh, by planting new woodland, um, you're creating a, a potential timber resource in the future. You've got the opportunity to restore wooded landscapes. Uh, you can provide a lasting legacy for both yourself or your family in an inheritance uh, sense, improving wildlife and connectivity as Stuart described. Um, and of course, the one that I'm going to talk about is help reduce climate change. I also wanted to add that uh, in driving around the southwest with my family, quite often I will exclaim that in the distance there's a woodland that I helped uh, plan and plant many years ago. And of course the girls, their eyes will roll backwards and sigh because it's not the first time I may have mentioned this, but it does give me and many foresters, uh, you know, a personal and professional pride of what we've done and what we've added into the landscapes over the years. I suppose now more than ever, this saying of the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, because that's when the woodland becomes uh, visible and clear in the landscape um, and productive. Uh, but the next best time is now. So, uh, just wanted to set the scene because we will talk about the Forestry Commission and, and the drive for private uh, planting. And the Forestry Commission uh, are the single largest single landowner and a lot of that was established back in uh, 1919 when uh, after the First World War a lot of planting was carried out. But more recently, uh, government has tried to encourage planting in the private sector through grant aid and uh, fiscal arrangements. And it's still true to say that private ownership of woodland remains uh, the largest area of woodland and certainly with broadleaf trees the largest share is owned in the private sector not the Forestry Commission. The forestry Commission are made up of uh, three areas so Forestry England um, manage and own uh, the land that most people see with the, um, the vans running around or the signs outside the woodland gates where people walk woodlands and there's generally public access available. There's the forestry or forest services arm and they're the ones that administer the grants, encourage woodland creation, um, also will liaise with other stakeholders uh, and provide licenses and the legislative uh, background to uh, woodland and woodland permanence. Finally, you've got forest research uh, and, and they're very important with looking at tree breeding, uh, climate change impacts on trees, um, pests and diseases, which we're all aware of, and, and how to reduce those risks. So they're a very important part of our armory going forward. So as I said, uh, and as Alice has said, it is a rural business uh, across uh, the whole of the UK. And, and in the past, we've been driven by, perhaps by tax things, uh, by tax incentives uh, and grants. But today there's, there's a wider range of benefits and therefore drivers for woodland creation and carbon is one of these, as you can see. With any grants that are provided by government and by public funding, they look to seek to benefit uh, quite a wide array, array of, um, of outcomes. Uh, and that's true uh, historically and in the future. So what does woodland creation look like? Well, first of all, of course, we're going to need land. Uh, and as Alice has suggested, we're going to need a lot of land is ready to be planted into uh, woodlands of the future. More importantly, we're going to need lots of young seedling trees ready for planting. Um, if you were to order a tree from a nursery today, that tree would have taken 
probably three years to, to grow to its current state ready for sale. And that comes from seed collection, uh, sowing the seed bed, transplanting to grow larger, and then finally grading ready for the purpose. And with climate mitigation and with pests and diseases, we're looking to use a wider range of tree species. Um, and of course, tree nurseries need to be able to know and have commitment from people on what trees they will need in the future. And finally, we will need uh, the technical advice of, of forest managers and forest workers able to choose the right tree for the right place with the right guarding and protection against all the herbivores that despite what anyone ever says about not having any rabbits or deer are lurking around the uh, side of every hedgerow just waiting for a tree to be planted. So what you can see here is just an example of a tree planted in a um, biodegradable tree shelter. Uh, but in the far distance, you can just see that there's a, a deer fence. Uh, and this is the best way of getting a lot of trees established. So the aim, the, the first thing's got to be uh, the three Ps in this case, and that's plan, prepare and plant. Uh, get trees of the right trees in the right place, and more importantly, for the right purpose. Then you need a bit of time. And as we said, once you get to about year 10, year 15, the trees start to become a, a visible asset. And the most important thing that we'll hear about uh, a little further on is they are measurable. Finally, um, a woodland that is maturing, creating products that are part of the ownership and the direction of travel. So funding currently probably isn't enough with the aspirations, uh, but it's a start. And we can see in this graph that um, we, we can deliver large scale planting across the UK. Uh, but up until the 1990s, uh, it was peaks and troughs, but then all of a sudden it, it dived. If you put another screen up of um, encouragement through either tax relief or grants, you'll see what has encouraged the most planting in the, in the certain locations. Um, we've got a long way to go. So we mean, need to make a start. Alice has, has said that we, uh, we need to plant trees now. And with our target of the 30,000 hectares, I think we're all agreed that England's target is around 10,000. Well, that's 18 million trees planted every single year. Um, and that will take some doing. Uh, it will take all the things we've talked about and also you will need fortitude because the current grass grant system and permissioning routes uh, are quite bureaucratic uh, we're trying to change that but that will take time as well so the forestry commission are keen to lead the way with forestry as well as uh, natural england and the royal payments agency and they've come up with the woodland carbon fund scheme um, this uh, was uh, announced a few years ago. It was quite slow to take off and they have improved it uh, over the years with feedback from practitioners such as ourselves. Married to that, more recently unveiled is the Carbon Guarantee Scheme, where the Forestry Commission are looking to underwrite the future values of carbon. And I'll come on to that in a bit. So the Woodland Carbon Fund. Um, this is, as Stuart said, uh, it promotes productive forestry, so it's looking for higher yield class um, uh, broadleaves as well as conifers. Uh, remember, all new planting has to match the UK uh, woodland standard. Um, and so it's not just for monocultures. It has to be a balanced, uh, well thought through proposal. Uh, there are another other, a number of other benefits of it. Um, basic payment scheme can still be claimed as, as it was under the uh, countryside stewardship scheme and in fact the, the payment rates are virtually the same for the carbon woodland fund as opposed to the countryside stewardship so there's no benefits there uh, it is i do have to say that it is for larger scale commercial woodland and so the minimum size has to be 10 hectares of woodland creation so what other support is available on top of that grant and um, I refer here to biodiversity credits. That's still a very new uh, market where perhaps you might be encouraged to plant a particular field rather than another one. 
uh, they might um, there might be benefits for planting an arable field to remove nitrates being put onto the soil as opposed to planting the next door uh, grass field and there would be funding and benefits available uh, either from the water companies or private industry to, to promote that. The most the biggest game changer recently has been the, the carbon um, sale opportunities. Uh, they're not new but there are new angles on it. So carbon, we talk about carbon, what is carbon? Well it's not just as we foresters might normally think of as the stem volume that we're producing, which is what we sell at the end of a, of a harvest, but it's, it's also the, the tops of those trees, the branches, the needles, the roots, and, and more importantly, uh, over the last few years of, of study and uh, looking into this, is the undisturbed soil carbon. This grant, uh, uh, sorry, this graph shows the um, the way that carbon is accumulated on the site. So this takes into consideration the soil as well as um, the growth, the biotic growth of the trees. Do notice that it, it reaches a peak and that's when where trees start dying naturally through their natural rotation. The, the gaps are then um, regenerated naturally or, or through planting and so you get into this balance of carbon on the site. It's also worth noting that it doesn't start at zero because when we plant trees and we put deer fences in and we might put guards on the trees and just, just the act of getting to site to plant the trees produces carbon. So it is slightly carbon negative for the first few years. So some examples of some schemes. These are schemes that uh, were, were registered to go forward. They're a range in size from seven hectares to 50 hectares. And I've made certain assumptions on, on costs and inputs here. But this shows uh, a mixture of both conifers and mixed broadleafs for various objectives of, of management. And um, the planting grants are taken as uh, a mixture of both individual guards and some deer fencing. So we can see the range of planting grants that you might, uh, might attract. So now comes the woodland carbon code. The Woodland Carbon Code is a, an independent um, body set up to establish a register of potential schemes, provide some professional scrutiny on schemes, and it provides uh, an avenue to both register your schemes to sell your carbon, and it's uh, an avenue for people to then buy that carbon, for industry or individuals to buy that carbon. As a single repository of those schemes, uh, it acts as a, a unifying um, process. When you look to uh, establish how much carbon you are going to produce from your scheme, uh, the carbon code has a carbon calculator, and this is common to any scheme. You put the information in, it will produce the anticipated carbon achievable. You have two ways of selling that carbon. You can, you can sell the carbon up front on the uh, initial planting of the woodland. Or we've now got a new player in town, uh, which is the Forestry Commission Woodland Carbon Guarantee Scheme. They have introduced an auction uh, and with great aplomb, they unveiled a 50 million pound fund, which was a bit of sleight of hand because a lot of that 50 million pounds won't actually be spent until the carbon is actually physically sequestrated in 10, 15, 20 years time. So the, the auction uh, establishes a base level whereby if in 10 or 15 years time you wish to sell your carbon, it will be underwritten by the Forestry Commission at that price. You are free to sell it to other people at a higher price or other people at a lower price. It just establishes the, the bottom price. But as you can see, these figures are quite considerable. And this is taken from the first carbon auction, where the average price was around £23 a carbon unit. Um, we don't know where that will go. It may go up, it may go down. Um, another auction is just about to be held in the next few weeks. So we can just see that the total maximum payments are, are quite considerable. And, and in fact, in a lot of cases, the payment from carbon, I do have to stress this is a payment. It's not a grant. It's a contract that you enter into to provide carbon. It's a service 
uh, an outcome of the wood. Um, but you can see that it's twice the value of the initial planting grants. So quite considerable, but there are lots of issues that an owner has to weigh up and decide which way to go, both in terms of when and how you sell your carbon and for how much. But do remember that you've sold the carbon, but you still own the trees. It's only the carbon encouragement, should we call it. You also have the wildlife enhancement, the landscape benefits. So, and all those other benefits you started off thinking about when you considered planting the woodland, you still own on top of all that grant and encouragement. Then. So I wanted to just say a very quick uh, thing about the, the art of silver culture. Alice mentioned about the fact that timber should go into carbon dioxide uh, beneficial timber streams. That won't happen without some intervention. So it's good that woodlands are managed for the long-term benefit of the objectives of ownership. And uh, you know, we as a company have been doing this for 70 years, planting woodlands for owners, managing them, thinning them, felling them, and then replanting them and starting all over again. But I do believe we will be known as carbon engineers, or at least I'd like to think so. And I'll have something else to tell the girls when we're driving around the countryside. And again, with a well-managed woodland, you get all these other benefits. It will be healthier. It is better for pests and diseases to keep something uh, thinned and keep air movement coming through a canopy. It will be more productive um, and it is better for wildlife. Finally, I think you know, we're talking about the climate uh, primarily with uh, the carbon. I think it's, it, we have to establish that we're planting a tree now for perhaps a rotation. The shortest rotation might be 40 years, it might be 150 years. The climate will change over that time. And the forest research have helped here by modeling what might happen in certain species in certain areas. So we have to be careful that we don't just continue doing the same old thing. We have to take consideration of pest diseases and climate change. So the mitigation here are all sorts of things that have been going on over the last 10 or 15 years, driven by the Forestry Commission, which is helpful. Finally, um, a very good uh, colleague where I first started work at Long Leet, uh, always used to say, never plant a tree for an end market in mind. Uh, the market will always change. The oak that we've planted today, if we'd been planting that 200, 300 years ago, we'd have been planting that with a view of creating the next naval ship required. Today, we're producing wonderful timber that goes into high-end use house builds, uh, decorative timber, and, and something that shows that all that effort, all those years is not wasted and it goes into use. Thank you very much. We'll be ready to take questions once we get this back to Tim. And we have got some questions uh, now, which is good. So um, I'll let Tim coordinate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Julian. Um, we're now going to put together uh, the panel so that we can answer the questions. Um, thank you for the questions. I've got the numbers climbing rapidly now. Um, no pressure then. Uh, let's start off with the first one. Um, the question is, that the emphasis appears to be on woodland creation, but what about the demand side? Are there, for example, any initiatives uh, that link forestry to the construction sector to promote increased use of domestically grown wood for the better building? Uh, the quick answer to that is yes, there are uh, several initiatives, one of which is um, Good for Wood, Wood for Good, um, that is trying to link the construction sector back to the growing sector. Um, certainly in our own business, um, we do a lot of sawmilling with BSW, the, the, the largest sawmiller in, in, in the country, uh, and they are very heavily linked to the construction sector. Um, Julian Stewart, any comments on that? I would also add, Tim, that um, 
quite a lot of the tree breeding uh, today with the big commercial species such as Douglas fir and uh, Sitka spruce is not about rate of growth, but we're also looking to make sure that um, density, not size, everything to do with more of that produce going into high end construction use um, is important. So I think that's always been a driver from the forest research as well. So I think that's certainly keen. We've got the uh, UK Woodland Assurance Scheme um, that if we register properties and they're managed in the really truly sustainable fashion, they get the mark of uh, the FSC mark. Uh, so that gains marketplace for, for well managed woodlands as well. Good. Okay. Uh, question for Stuart. Um, your case study sounded like it got a lot of support in terms of grants. Mm. Uh, can you explain a bit about the process of securing those gar grants? Uh, how long did it take and was it relatively smooth? Um, in this example, it was relatively smooth. Um, it was about a six month period. Um, but as I touched in on in my presentation, we sought to work with the key stakeholders um, with regards to the AOMB and the Yorkshire Dales National Park uh, characteristics and desires for woodland expansion within that area. So um, I can't say that every scheme would receive such support and, uh, and work on that sort of timescale, but uh, in this instance, it was six months. Okay. Uh, the next question then um, for the panel, uh, to encourage farmers to plant and then manage woodland areas, particularly tenant farmers, do you think the new support scheme post BPS will provide sufficient capital grants and more importantly, income incentives to give up their arable and livestock uses of that land to make it happen? Stuart, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there is a move away from payments for payment's sake, and BPS is very much just an area-based payment. Um, the government's uh, desire is to see payments for benefits achieved. And as such, whilst you know, I, can't, I can't say that um, uh, you know, case by case basis, people will be better off if people adopt a, a forward thinking approach where biodiversity, woodland enhancement, uh, diversity within their landscape is part of their remit, they, they should be able to manage effectively the, the income streams to be gained from these. Okay, Alice, have you got any thoughts on the, from the policy side? Yeah, I, I was thinking it, it is a really great question. Um, and we've been doing quite a lot of work with our members, but also with the Tenant Farmers Association to make sure that um, payment rates are enough. Um, but the quite important part of Elm is that it's the, the public goods that it pays for. Um, our climate change mitigation and adaptation, clean and plentiful, plentiful water, clean air, I'm going to forget some, thriving plants and wildlife and beauty, heritage and engagement or something like that. And I think there might be one other that I've forgotten. But um, trees is sort of the one thing that actually provides every single one of those. So it's it's definitely going to be paid for under ELM in some form or another. And um, it does mean that whatever the payment rates are, it might be that it's less productive agricultural land um, that can kind of economically afford to go into uh, go into trees and it might be finding ways to both use the land productively for food but also um, uh, but also for trees through things like agroforestry um, but yeah it does it, it is very likely that Elm will I mean Elm will have to be enough um, to incentivize uh, a change in land use towards trees. Good thank you for that. I'd also Tim the, on the carbon front um, you know, this is exactly what the government are looking for, for this uh, stacking of extra funding into land. So it's not just about payment for the trees. Um, and that carbon can be sold, uh, according to the, the choices you make, carbon can be sold at any point and in, in any lumps as you go along. You can, so you can sell it in advance and get some cash flow up front. Or periodically, every five years, you can measure how much carbon you've got on your site. 
and then choose to sell up a portion of that or wait and sell it a bit later. So that, that provides an ongoing cash flow. And remember, once those trees get to 20, 25 years old, they can be thinned as well. And you can get you know, ta on current uh, tax systems, tax free income from selling the timber. Good, good. Back to you, Stuart, and, and your case study that you presented. Um, what was the net loss to the landowner after all cost grant receipts uh, are taken into account? The first year after the capital investment to the plant, tree planting and fencing, there was a, about a £30,000 cost um, associated with the scheme. Um, as I touched on before, the, the area payments are based on standard costs and uh, seek to achieve about an 80% um, funding for um, the capital items under contract stewardship with 100% and the under the uh, HS2, um, with the ongoing management um, uh, payments of £200 a hectare, the, the 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 plan was for the scheme to break even over that period. However, there are some variabilities um, with loss replacement. We've had several drought years uh, and make ongoing maintenance that, that can't be factored in. So. But generally speaking, the first year cost was about £30,000 on that 50 hectare scheme. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Julian, a little bit of detail here. Uh, does the 10 hectare limit have to be in a block, in a single block, or can it be smaller non-connective sections added together to reach 10 hectares? Um, well, the short answer is probably yes, at uh, either. Um, according to the rules of the scheme, it has to be in a 10 hectare block, uh, but then with extra five hectare blocks allowed after that. Now, I'm a true believer that as long as you, your intention is to plant 10 hectares, we take it to the Forestry Commission and we look at how we can mould that into connectivity, um, making sure the blocks are linked in some way, uh, but the rules state that it has to be a 10 hectare hectare block at the moment but that 10 hectare block can be over different ownerships so if you've got a neighbor that's willing to plant five and you're willing to plant five and then five elsewhere you can make schemes up in this way but i think the forestry commission are reviewing this all the time they want to see the success of these schemes uh, they've proved that they've relaxed the rules to date um, so we, we take a lot of applications to the forestry commission and work our way around it Great. Uh, the next uh, questioner, um, in my experience, the RPA are very slow at processing the Woodland Creation Grant claim and paying out, which has understandably caused frustration with landowners. Can we be a bit more hopeful that as the agricultural and environmental policy is reformed through the Agricultural Bill and the Environment Bill, that woodland schemes will also be better administrated? preferably not by the RPA? Well, all I would say on that front is that the Forestry Commission are certainly recruiting people to help the process. They understand the process now much more than they did five years ago. Um, we, we still have the RPA that hold the purse strings and the payment process. With the Woodland Carbon Fund, it's a Forestry Commission scheme, so we think, well, that's outside of the RPA, but unfortunately, it still gets paid by the RPA, so you don't get away that easily. Um, there are moves afoot to try and make woodland creation much more user friendly, streamlining the bureaucracy, and, and, and payment process has got to be part of that. We're, we're, we're on their case, uh, and it will happen. It's just a question of when. Good. I would just add that's a big um, lobbying point for the CLA at the moment is to make sure that whatever. However the system works, it's efficient and pays people on time. That's good, that's good. Um, the next questioner uh, starts off with really useful webinar. Thank you for that comment. Uh, woodland planting is still a manual task. Do you see a future of more technology stroke mechanization being used to make it more efficient and ensure that we can plant? The 18 million trees a year and also what needs to happen to ensure the nurseries will be able to supply all these trees. 
Julian, you've had some experience of uh, mechanised planting, albeit a few years ago. And um, we, we, as you say, Tim, we were planting through with the use of planting machines back in the early 90s when in the southwest we had the southwest um, woodland fund and um, it, it was horses for courses machines worked well on the right soils and in the right conditions um, the, the actual interestingly it, it, it increases productivity but we didn't find that the price came down particularly um, but we were able to plant more trees quicker but with fewer people um, we are looking at developing the machinery that we had in the 1990s and improving it for the, the modern day. We've got some machines already working for us. And of course, there was the mechanization of the restocking process where we had carousels of cell grown plants being uh, mechanically planted. Uh, I haven't seen that produced in the wider scale, but uh, research and development is all part of this as well. Yeah. In, in fact, we are planting uh, with a mechanised system tractor and um, effectively converted cabbage planter up in Aberdeenshire uh, this year, and we'll have another couple of hundred hectares next year. So, yes, but Julian's comment about white soils and, and white site is is absolutely key. Um, going back to you, Julian, uh, the question is: What price did you say? Uh, was the average for carbon in the first FC auction uh, and is this available on top of the Woodland Carbon Code? So the the Woodland Carbon Code is simply the, the register of schemes and the calculator of how much carbon you will produce. They produce the marketplace. What you sell it for is what is available in the marketplace at that particular time. So you can you can sell it in advance as, as future units, um, or you can wait, put it through the auction, and then sell it uh, as it's accumulated and it's measurable. It has to be measurable for the carbon auction process. So you, you, you can sell a proportion of it in advance, but the primary thing is it has to be verified every five or 10 years throughout the crop's life. So how much, to date, the, the rate is very variable. It's like any sort of supply and demand situation. If people want to buy carbon, they will have to pay a bit more because there's not a lot of woodland creation going on. If, you, if you're selling your carbon units in advance, there's a risk associated with that. The carbon isn't actually there. There's an intention to produce it and it will be uh, verified and inspected, but it's still an intention. So the rates are usually anywhere between five and 15 pounds for selling your carbon in advance. However, the most recent auction uh, of carbon when you actually accumulate it has been priced anywhere between 20 and 30 pounds per carbon unit, according to where the scheme is, whether there's other add-on benefits of that particular scheme. So it also comes down to where you are and the type of woodland that you're creating. So the benefits of £30, and that £30 is index linked, so it will grow as the trees grow. Um, you're not likely to see much of that until at least year 10, when you can start measuring it. Um, so there's lots of variable options in there. And of course, a lot depends on the owner's objectives. Do they want to tie the land up to the, the carbon contract that they have to sign? So there's, there's lots of considerations to be made. Okay, uh, following on, um, is the Woodland Carbon Code stroke guarantee viable on smaller woodlands, say under 10 hectares? Uh, that's a good question because it's, it is not limited by size uh, when you register your scheme. However, the cost of uh, val valid uh, validating the scheme and then the verification every five or 10 years, there's a cost element to that. Now that usually works out that a scheme on its own of less than three hectares is probably not going to produce enough carbon value to overcome those sort of cost inputs. So anything over three hectares, however, you, there is options for you to uh, bring schemes together under a group scheme and that reduces the individual 
cost. But then everyone has to sign up to a common uh, obligation and, and a aims of being within that scheme. So usually I think the baseline would be three hectares uh, or more, then start looking at it very seriously. And do you think we're anywhere near a uh, position where the Woodland Carbon Code recognises carbon capture by better management of existing woodlands? At the, at the current time, unfortunately, I think it disincentives uh, the good management because if you put a scheme in and you say it will be non-thin and continuous cover, that calculates more carbon available. Um, however, we know as professional managers, the last thing you want to do is commit to a stand and not to thin it. Of all the benefits I showed uh, from you know, the art of silver culture, and as Alice said about getting more, more timber into business streams, future. Uh, so you, I always say that look at carbon and, and treat it as a top up, as an additional fund. Don't use it as your primary objective of a scheme. How does the uh, selling the carbon affect landowners' freedom to manage the trees and the land? Uh, you, say this, you, you say that they still own the trees, but can they be harvested? So they can be harvested. When, when you put your scheme into the carbon calculator, you both establish the input carbon. So are you going to put them into tree shelters? Are you going to open plant them? Are you going to put deer fence up? Are you going to spray the trees? Those sort of questions. That calculates your input carbon. Um, and you also have to state how you're going to manage that stand. Now that also is aspirational. You know, you will thin it or you won't thin it. But you have to put that in so that the carbon calculator works. Um, it still would be then subject to a felling license requirement as it is today. And there was talk from the Forestry Commission of making sure that the felling license process linked into the carbon register so they can make sure that if you undertook not to thin it, and then you chose to thin it, there would have to be some questions asked about how much carbon you are actually going to produce. And this is one of the things about the, the carbon contract, is that when you sign that carbon contract, you are undertaking to deliver that many units of carbon in the future. If, for whatever reason, you don't, you may well have to buy those on the open market and sell them back to whoever bought your carbon in the first, first place. So does that answer the question, uh once you um, got the values used in the carbon calculator, uh, except for the foreseeable future, for, or for the life of the schemes, or could they be altered as and when the data comes in? The, the, the undertaking at the moment is that you can go back and review your management plan and change it, but that will or may have an effect on the amount of carbon. So if you've sold all your carbon up front and then you change your management style and it produces less carbon ultimately because of that style of management you may have a gap now the carbon code creates a gap within the calculations um, and they use this buffer to make sure that you do have that flexibility and that they don't disencourage people to go into this by using all their possible potential carbon so there is a buffer there so probably that buffer is usually around 10, 15, 20%. Um, so that probably allows an owner to change their mind from not, not thinning to then choosing to thin and to have intervention uh, at some point in the future. And that's absolutely critical when we're planting more and more mixtures of trees to overcome uh, pests and diseases and uh, to, to mitigate the potential climate change impacts of those crops for the next 150 years. We will look at more mixtures. And the last or, you know, we all know through our experience, when you plant a mixture of trees, they never grow according to plan. Some will outperform others, some will shade others, and the, what you need to do is get in and, and intervene and thin and manipulate the crop. I'll give you a wee rest now after all the, uh, the carbon. <laughs> Thank <stuff>. you. <laughs> uh, so the next question talks about it's really important move in making these webinars for uh, an engaging uh, the farming community. Uh, what are the next steps for the forest industry in changing perceptions and creating closer relations with agriculture? Alice, do you want to kick off with that in terms of CLA uh, and, and the management of 
um, or bringing these two, these industries together? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, yeah, I'm not I'm not forestry industry, but I think that the CLA likes to think we sort of sit in a nice middle ground where we represent um, farmers, landowners, and foresters. And a lot of our members are engaged in trees in some form or another, but also um, in agriculture. So we're really working on strategies that look at land use as a whole, look at how we can yeah meet climate change goals, um, but also yeah a number of other goals by bringing together both. Um, yeah, all different types of land uses depending on the different type of land. But it is really important that there is more engagement across the two. They don't have to be separate. Um, and in the, in the middle ground isn't sort of strictly agroforestry. There's so many, there's sort of this big spectrum, I suppose, um, which is why we're doing a lot of talking about trees on farms because it's a bit of a, a catch-all title that doesn't limit anybody into how they want to um, yeah, start getting engaged in trees um, or forestry and woodland. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a really important uh, part of the whole picture to look at land use as a whole and make sure that farmers don't think of themselves as just farmers and foresters don't think of themselves as just foresters, but everyone sort of looks, looks at their role as stewards or yeah, managers of land um, yeah, more holistically. There are a number of, uh, thank you for that, Alice, that, that there are a couple of uh, trial examples in Scotland where uh, they're looking at land use strategies on, on a smaller scale um, and, and that's throwing up some quite interesting in, in, information. Yeah. Good. The, the, the last question here now is uh, we've looked at the need to plant trees in the UK. Uh, is it best to have any mitigation close to the source of pollution? What is being done to plant up roadsides and other areas already in public ownership. Julian, that's probably one, one, one for you. And then uh, Stuart, perhaps you could add a bit in. Well, I, I do know um, that a lot of local authorities have taken up the climate emergency uh, call, uh, especially in this part of the world, Cornwall have been leading that uh, quite strongly. They are looking to plant trees on any land where they have either influence or, or ownership. Um, so it is being considered. Uh, I, I know that the uh, Ministry of Defence, they're looking at planting rock trees on their land and that will help uh, both from their training facilities, but also it will help reduce uh, diffuse pollution and that sort of thing on their holding. So it, it is being done. Um, and there is a, a fund for urban tree planting uh, that was released uh, earlier this year, I believe. And uh, that's certainly been taken up across the country, both in terms of urban forestry, but also urban individual tree planting. So it, it is being done. Got anything to, to add there, Stuart? I know I just echo uh, what Julian said. Yes, you know, local authorities are very much making very bold statements about their desires to become uh, carbon neutral. Um, and any large infrastructure uh, project has green infrastructure very much at its heart. I touched on the HS2 fund. Um, that's obviously targeting adjacent landowners within a uh, effectively a 50 mile wide corridor, but also the HS2 project itself has a uh, very large um, tree planting going on within its footprint. And similarly, any other large civils project um, has the same sort of commitment. So. Yeah, there is a desire there and, and very much growing at a, at a local level with the local authorities taking it on board now and we're working closely with a number of authorities around the country to, to help them in their, in their mission. Okay, I thought that was the last question but we've uh, got a couple more to keep coming. Um, what resources exist to advise on priority areas best for woodland creation, uh, other habitat creation and optimal agricultural use etc? Oh, um, certainly uh, in, in, in Scotland, they have um, mapping exercises, uh, woodland strategies. Uh, is that replicated in England, Julian? Yes, the, um, the Forestry Commission have identified, you know, priority planting areas. I'm always slightly concerned about that because it it creates a line on a map where on one side of that line woodland's encouraged and just a few meters away 
if by inference it's not encouraged. So I, I'm, I'm not a great fan of that sort of spatial uh, targeting. Um, what is helpful, I think, Stuart touched on the Woodland Creation Planning Grant. That does look to identify all those impacts around where you're planting. And you have to take a lot of consideration of all those other stakeholders and adapt your initial application to make sure that it takes account of those. Um, so I think that's a strong tool that everybody's encouraged to, to, to get um, and to use. We just need to speed speed it up because it's, it's just taking too long. That's the problem. Uh, okay, and, and uh, one more question uh, being asked by someone who started an MSC in forestry in September. Uh, what would you say are the current main gaps in skills stroke knowledge in the sector uh, that may have to be bridged to achieve the capacity needed to meet these new targets? You're looking at me, Tim? Ah, well done, Stuart. Go on. <laughs> As an industry, like many uh, land-based industries, we're, we're struggling to get people into the industry across a wide spectrum of skill sets from uh, the, 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 the very bottom to the top. Uh, tree planting, we're touching on just, just guys on the ground planting trees. Um, we are seeing an ever aging contractor resource um, that uh, really needs to be bolstered by the youth coming in today. And the education system uh, and is not encouraging people to consider rural uh, um, careers. So it is, it is, there's not just one gap in what we need to do to have in place to deliver our ambitions. It is across all skill sets. Julian? I'd just say that um, we did work quite closely with uh, the, the education sector in terms of creating the forestry apprenticeship. Um, but the uptake hasn't been great. Um, it's always been thus, you know, forestry is a small industry comparative to agriculture. Um, we do need to encourage people in. Certainly organisations such as uh, the Royal Forestry Society have a fantastic um, facility online that points people in the right direction. And of course, Till Hill uh, promote the, the graduate scheme where we take on, you know, anywhere between sort of six and, and 12 graduates each year to give them the practical experience they need if they come out with the technical knowledge uh, that's great but it has to be balanced with actual practical knowledge of how trees grow how they get planted uh, what works what doesn't work and the difference between one species and another um, but we we as an industry need to work well and make sure that those people are encouraged and we get the message out to um, trade shows and um, graduate schemes as well. Good. Alice, have you got any uh, thoughts on skills and knowledge uh, groups? I would completely echo what um, Julian and Stuart have said and then also just note that there is a bit of a gap at the moment in terms of um, agroforestry knowledge and expertise um, but and that's something that I think needs to um, yeah, be scaled up a wee bit, whether it's about training people or whether it's about just getting the message out there to farmers about how they can um, yeah, incorporate trees into productive farm systems. Um, and yeah, there's, there are plenty of great resources out there. Um, and I think there are other people out there who have the skills, but um, it's about kind of yeah, getting, that, getting that message out there, I think. Okay. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, one last comment. Uh, are there any site thinking house builders, water companies, etc., with woodland landowners? Um, William, all I can think of at the moment is uh, Wood for Good, which uh, tries to do that. There's also the, the, there is the government push for uh, net biodiversity gain where house builders not only, or developers not only have to demonstrate no let, net loss on the site that they're developing, but they have to increase uh, biodiversity as part of their planning process. Alice might be able to say a bit more about this, but that should be an encouragement to help woodland creation or, or managing uh, existing woodlands in a, in, a, in a more 
biodiversity based environmental enhancement way, uh, restoring ancient woodlands, that sort of thing. Um, so there, there is a push there. Um, we do have to always think about timber production in our in the back of our mind, you know, for these woodlands to be of benefit in the future all the way around. Um, I'm a great advocate of using um, improved oak from either Holland or uh, France. So they're, they're coming from further south um, geographically, so they should be adapted to climate change. They're Quercus rober, but they grow beautifully straight. They're quicker to grow. Uh, why wouldn't we plant those rather than um, perhaps local native to the site that's simply going to run out of steam through, through climate change? And we can produce something that is valuable through timber. Um, so we should be always aiming for that. But the encouragements are there, but they're not as direct as perhaps we might wish. Lovely. Thank you. Well, I think that's uh, most of the questions. Um, um, there are a few closing remarks for myself. Uh, I hope that Alice has given you an insight in terms of climate change and changing policies. CAP out and UK new agricultural policy coming in. Species choice for woodlands, as Julian has just mentioned, is becoming even more important and the decisions that we make remain for many years, so it's doubly important to get it right. We need uh, carbon sequestration from species that will thrive in our changing climate. Stuart and Julian have given you a glimpse of how Till Hill can help get, you get a better understanding of how we design, plan and execute farm woodland and creation. Over the years, Till Hill have planted about a billion trees uh, and worked through many grant schemes. We do this as a living and we know what we do. Uh, we want you to benefit from our experience. Sir David Attenborough and Greater Thunberg, two different generations pushing for tree planting to save our planet. That's a thought to go home with. The next webinar in our series takes place next month and we'll focus on Wales. So watch out for info on our social media and our website. Thank you for listening and thank you for your good searching questions. Safe travels, if it's, uh, even if it's just going back to the kitchen to get a cup of coffee. Thank you very much.